Hey everybody, I'd like to tell you a little story today. This is going to be about the electric revolution starting with Reagan and going to Elon Musk. So our story begins in 1953. Reagan is done with his career riding horses in Hollywood and instead he's been hired by 220 utilities nationwide to spread the message about electrification. Now, what he does is he directs little pieces of theater once a week on a television show, and it got really big. It was a top 10 television show. The show, of course, drew attention to the advertisements. That's what he's hired to do. He advertised clean nuclear power for General Electric and Westinghouse, as well as air source heat pumps for space heating, air source heat pumps for water heating, all electric kitchen appliances, a better lifestyle so you could live better electrically. Now, after eight years of success, going around the country as pitchman for the all-electric movement, clean nuclear power paired with a better lifestyle, Reagan was fired. It came out that uh, when he was resolving his first divorce, he'd done a little financial self-dealing that wasn't legal. So when the scandal came out, he was fired, and he took that opportunity to leave his all-electric mansion and go to the governor's mansion in 1966. He ran successfully and won. When he arrived in office though, Los Angeles was a mess. The air pollution levels were thick smog. The, the law that he passed had huge far ranging implications. This law set the first fuel efficiency standards for cars in the country. And interestingly, in 1970, California, kind of because of Reagan, got a waiver from the federal government from the Clean Air Act, which allowed California forevermore to set higher fuel efficiency standards for vehicles than the rest of the country. Now, that's an irony because that standard is how California started the modern all-electric car movement in 1990. The law that began in 67, the waiver in 1970, is now why we have half of all electric cars in the United States are sold in California. So in 1973, unfortunately, electrification came to a screeching halt. The oil embargo from OPEC raised electricity prices 300% overnight. Now, just days earlier, Reagan had vetoed a, a law that was going to create an energy agency to try to enforce building efficiency and make power plants uh, developed in a more sensible, cost-effective way. Because of the energy crisis, he immediately reversed himself and he unvetoed it, passed the law. That law, which created the first energy agency in the United States before the, the Department of Energy itself, that once again got waivers with the next set of laws that were federal and allowed California forevermore to set the highest building codes in the country. Today, of course, we're about to move into 100% solar powered housing. In 2020, we're gonna have to put solar rays in every single home. So, once again, you see a legacy that began in the 70s. Today, this is where we are, all electric and solar powered. Now, that message was a long time coming. <clears throat> Carter put solar panels on the White House when he got in office in 76. And he preached the gospel saying, conservation is the only way we can buy a barrel of oil for a few dollars. Unfortunately, when Reagan came into power in 1980, uh, that was not the message. Instead, it was about lowering energy prices by domestic fuel development. And he chose a vice president that was an oil baron, a millionaire from Texas, George H.W. Bush. Now, another little irony is that when they took down the solar panels in 1986, it was not the first act, it was something they did years later. When they took those down, those panels didn't come back to the White House until 2003, at the eve of the Iraq war, when Bush Jr. put them back on the White House. Now, the, um, the next big movement to electrification is around 1993. Fuel prices had dropped, and the all-electric housing movement started again. It was quiet. It wasn't driven by any policies or programs particularly. But now we have one in four homes being built all-electric. It's being led by the South, where 60% of homes are built all-electric. In this map, you can see the market share gained by all-electric construction is nationwide starting in about 2010. The reason why is because it costs $3,000 to $25,000 less if you put in an all-electric home. You don't have to put in 
any main lines in the street. You don't have to put in a lateral to the house. You don't have to do a meter set. You don't have to run gas lines through the house. You don't have to buy more expensive gas appliances, nor do you have to vent it. All of those add up to thousands of dollars, and that's why savvy developers don't do it. So policy-driven electrification starts in California again. It's in 2006. With the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, we promised ourselves in California a fossil fuel-free future, now by 2045. That future is being driven by the laws that were passed by Reagan in the 70s. Our energy code for buildings, our energy codes for power plants, as well as the all-electric car movement. It helps, though, that all-electric is generally cheaper in the country. It doesn't take policy, it just takes a pocketbook awareness. You can see that a heat pump water heater is about 30% less expensive to run on average in the United States than the very best gas water heater you can buy. And that's true generally of all electric versus gas. In most of the states of the country, it's cheaper to go all electric. But efficiency and cheap is not really the answer anymore. It's not even the question. What we discovered is that methane produces 100 times the impact on climate change of burning it. The leaking of it is worse than burning it. And all you have to do is get about a 1% leak for it to be equally as bad as burning coal. But as soon as you get to a 2% to the actual up to 17% leakages we're finding from fuel fields around the country, the only way to stop that is to stop using the gas completely. There's no efficiency measure that can overwhelm the damage that's being done by small leaks throughout the entire system. Now, all electric is getting a leg up because it's also a better way of living, not just cleaner or cheaper. Now, chefs like Julia Child, who only cooked an all electric through all of her years on public television, including Ming Tsai today, who was on PBS, they both favor all electric cooking. Uh, Wolfgang Puck of Spago, uh, Thomas Keller of the French Laundry. Even McDonald's around Los Angeles have gone all electric because they can get an extra basket of fries every five loads or some one minute less recharge if it's on all electric fryer. And the chefs, they're the ones that get the burns. It's gas burns about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can get a metal pot that hot and give you an instant three degree burn. And most chefs have gas burns up and down their arms. If you convert to an all electric kitchen, it's safer. Induction range is usually burned about 450 degrees Fahrenheit, not 3,500 degrees, and they're safe to touch. Now, <clears throat> other people would argue that an all-electric future is less resilient when in fact the facts show otherwise. In 2011, there's a gigantic tsunami that hits Japan. They close down one third of the power plants in the country, all the nuclear power plants and the country is left energy poor almost immediately. Nissan responded by taking their electric car, which had a 20 kilowatt hour battery, four times what's in a Tesla Powerwall, and they said, we're gonna allow you to now charge your house. They came out with like a $1,000 little suitcase battery charge controller. And that allows you to last for days, if not weeks, if you've got a solar array off of the grid. You can island your house. Nissan, Kia, Honda, BMW, Toyota, Mitsubishi, they all offer this $1,000 suitcase in Japan now, so you can go from vehicle to home. And it's been tested in Hawaii, it's been tested in Los Angeles Air Force bases. This is the most resilient strategy, is to have an electric car with a huge battery that you can use when you need it. You can't really do that with a gas tank. Those frequently run out after earthquakes, after just like a week or so. But solar power comes up every day, and you can just keep on running to the end. So <clears throat> it's been a, the culmination of this movement, I think, is in Elon Musk. I mean, his sunny vision for luxury, all electric luxury. It's faster, it's safer, it's more fun, it's a higher status car. I've gotten stuck in some traffic jams in the Bay Area. There are just Teslas all around me. About half of all the electric cars are sold in California because of Reagan's waiver that he got back in the early days requiring higher efficiency standards. So 70 years later, we have seen a revolution take place. 
It was not as planned. It doesn't pair nuclear power with electric devices of the 50s. It pairs cheap solar and wind power of today with even better, more efficient electric devices. And what we've seen is that all electric can do anything and do everything better. That is the, the completion of this story. What you see, we've gone from horses to horsepower, from Reagan to Musk, and we have a better world for it and hopefully getting better in the future. Thanks very much.